In this video, we will look at a new type of phrase called a complement phrase. It will allow us to insert sentences in two other sentences, like in aliens prefer dabbing when there is a full moon. So let's start with the concept of valency. There are verbs, like intransitive verbs, that don't need direct objects. As a matter of fact, some of them cannot take direct objects. For example, in I fall, I can't fall something. It always has to be just I fall. In I arrive, I also cannot arrive something. I cannot perform the action of arriving unto something else. These verbs have a valency of one. Because they only need one argument to function, they need the subject, as in I fall. Transitive verbs, on the other hand, need direct objects. For example, in I eat pizza or I eat this pizza, in theory, I always need to be eating something. So these verbs are going to have a valency of two because um, you need the subject, which is I, and then the direct object, which is pizza or this pizza, for example. We've seen um, transitive verbs take both noun phrases or determiner phrases as their direct objects. In I eat pizza, the direct object is a noun phrase. In I eat this pizza, it's a determiner phrase. Here we're going to look at one more type of direct object that we can have. Transitive verbs can take complement clauses as their direct objects. For example, in the sentence, Anna wants to eat pizza, what does she want? To eat pizza. And I heard that you made cookies. What did I hear? That you made cookies. Notice that it's working similarly to other uh, direct objects, like Anna wants, what does she want? Pizza. Anna wants, what does she want? To eat pizza. These, we're gonna put these in complement clauses, which we're gonna call CPs. And each of them is going to have as the head a word that we'll call the complementizer. This is a word that connects the two sentences. Anna wants to eat pizza. I heard that you made cookies. English is special in that it can have zero complementizers. So these are going to be like empty words that are still there. We know these objects are invisible, but still there because they are connecting one phrase with the other and living in the head of the complement phrase. This is what one of them would look like. For example, this is a complement phrase which rejects a complement bar. And then do you have a complement head to in the phrase to eat pizza? This is the one that connects one uh, this, the phrase to eat pizza with Anna wants to eat pizza. Then C has as its complement an inflectional phrase. So a full sentence like to eat, like eat pizza. Eat pizza is an infinitive verb. Nobody is doing this action yet, or at least there's no explicit subject here that's doing it. So we need to mark it as infinitive, as a verb that has no explicit subject within this clause. So we have the head, to, and then an, an inflected phrase for the infinitive, eat pizza. Where are we going to put this phrase? in the same position where we would put a direct object. We're going to have it as a sister of V. We're going to have it as a daughter of the V bar where the complements would go. So this final V bar projects the verb head once and the direct object, the complement, a complement phrase. So this phrase is the one that we have here, to infinite, infinitive eat pizza. Anna wants to eat pizza. So complement clauses can function as direct objects. They can also describe a verb. When they do this, we're going to call them subordinate clauses. You might have seen these before. For example, in you'll have Wednesdays because John makes pizza. You can eat it when you arrive, or you can eat it if you come to the party. So we're going to have these words be the head of the complement phrase, and then they're going to have 
a complement that is a fully inflected sentences, in sentence, like John makes pizza, you arrive, you come to the party. All these provide additional information about the verb, like uh, why do you love Wednesdays? Because John makes pizza. When can you eat it? When you arrive. Uh, when can you eat it? If you come to the party. So this is additional information that goes, that describes the verb, the action. And so we're going to put them where we put adverbs. We're going to put them as an adjunct to the verb because they're describing the action of the verb. This is what a CP would look like for a subordinate clause. It has a head, which is because, and then it has a fully inflected phrase like John makes pizza, conjugated for the present. You would put it again in an adjunct position. So you would have to generate an extra V bar that would have, uh, that would project the kind of like adverbial complement phrase. I'm sorry, subordinate clause. Because John makes pizza. And this action describes the verb love. Notice here that also the complement position is already occupied because you are loving something. You're loving the direct object, Wednesdays. So subordinate clauses describe the verb. Finally, we have relative clauses. These serve to describe nouns. They function like adjectives. So we can have the phrase, a phrase like pizza that she loves, and this whole phrase describes the pizza. This is, a, this is what, the, what kind of pizza it is, the one that she loves. You can have zero uh, relativizers in English. You can have pizza she loves, trees which are losing their leaves, and a student who hates music. So all of these are going to be the relativizers, the head of the complement phrase that is functioning as a relative clause that is describing a noun. Relative clauses are really interesting because they're really two sentences uh, like added up and stuck into one. If you can, uh, if you think of this phrase, the pizza that she loves is delicious. This is really the summation of two different phrases of the pizza is delicious and she loves the pizza. And these pizzas are the same pizza, so we're going to mark them with this uh, little I at the end. It's going to be like the index. So if we add these sentences, we would get the pizza that she loves. The pizza is delicious. However, that's not a legal string of words in English. So one of the copies of pizza has to go. In English, the internal one is the one that we erase so that we have a structure like the pizza that she loves is delicious. In, uh, to replace that uh, copy of pizza that we deleted, we're going to leave a trace. This little structure here is called a trace and, in the, and it's going to be co-indexed with that little i with the external copy, with the copy of pizza that stayed outside of the relative clause. So we're going to have a gap here that we're going to call a trace inside of the relative clause. And all of this is going to be an adjective to pizza. Because it's an adjective, it's going to be an adjunct of a noun. So let's first look at the, uh, the relative clause on its own. It's in a CP, and the head is of the phrase that she loves for pizza is that. Um, that takes as its complement a fully inflected phrase, she loves. And then look here. The verb loves has a direct object, which is just the trace for where the pizza was. This is a direct object position, and this is where pizza used to live. Now we have a little trace there indicating that the pizza was there, but it was deleted. When you merge these two, you have a pizza that she loves trace. So there were two pizzas, but now this one is deleted, and it lives through a trace that is co-indexed with the external pizza. And it's in an adjunct position. So it's in a first N bar, which then has another N bar for a potential complement, and then the head. All right, so we can have different types of CPs uh, that can have full sentences, and they can be inserted into other sentences, and they can have different functions. 
Some of them are complement clauses, which are direct objects of verbs, like in I wish to see you tomorrow. What do you wish? To see you tomorrow. Subordinate clauses are CPs that describe verbs. I'm going to eat before it gets cold. How are you going to eat it? Before it gets cold. Relative clauses are clauses that describe nouns, as in the pizza that I love. 